Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. It's fabulous to be here at the Wardrobe Theatre in Bristol. Uh, I love what you've done with the place. It's very nice. <laughs> Charming. It's always nice to perform in a venue that looks and feels like a really oversubscribed one of those puzzle room escape games. <laughs> Have you done those? There's a couple here, I know. They're so much fun. If you've never done one, what happens is uh, you and five friends get locked in a room by a stranger. Stay with me. And uh, you have to solve a bunch of puzzles, and if you solve them all within the hour, they, they let you out. Spoiler alert, they let you out anyway. But they're great fun. It's somewhere on an entertainment scale between, um, like, the crystal maze and burgling a grandparent. They're great fun. They're a really good way to find out under pressure which of your friends knows the meaning of the word clockwise. <laughs> Don't do one with a child, is my advice. I did one at the Edinburgh Festival last year. There were six of us there. One person dropped out. One of our team brought their 12-year-old son along last minute. And someone just drew breath. Oh. Yeah, there is nothing more disappointing in the world than uh, seeing an adult push a child out of the way of a filing cabinet <laughs> by its face. Like, its whole face. Like, I've got this! <laughs> Me and my brother did one a little while ago. Uh, he came down on a Tuesday afternoon. We did one here in Bristol. And um, he came down and we went along for his birthday. We turned up, we hadn't booked online. Normally you have to, you have to, to book online, but we just turned up on spec. And uh, we found, you know when you see like a, like a two-story building, just like a little house on its own, surrounded by rubble on an industrial estate. <laughs> and there were these uh, big imposing stone steps, a great big black door with a, a nameplate, but the nameplate was blank. And we thought, oh, the game's afoot. But, uh, <laughs> wrong building in the end. <laughs> so we tracked down the actual one. It's around the corner. We went in, and the first thing that happens is you have to... You've really got to throw yourself in, right? If you, if you hold back, you, you don't get the most out of it. So the first thing that happens is you have to undergo a slightly eggy mission briefing from a drama graduate in a lab coat. <laughs> And part of you, to be honest, is biting your tongue because you're thinking, come on, mate, if you knew anything about strategy, you'd be in a soap opera. But you don't... <laughs> it just sounds mean. I think you're going to have to accept that that bit just sounds mean. <laughs> Sorry, I record all of my shows, even this one, for quality and training purposes. And um, I will, what I do is I'll listen back to this in a cafe uh, about nine o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> it's going quite well. <laughs> Believe in yourself. <laughs> So we went in, we did the briefing, and we had a good time. It was all right. It, was, it wasn't my favourite one. It was kind of spy-themed, a bit of an over-reliance on number puzzles. Uh, they say mankind is only three meals away from barbarism, but we're apparently only one padlock combination from punching your brother in the neck. Who knew? <laughs> We, we finished up. It's great fun. We finished up, and then uh, we, we thanked the guy, took a picture of him, it was fantastic, and then we left, and we got a couple of blocks away before I suddenly realised I hadn't paid, right? And it was, it was 50 quid, which normally you'd share between six people, but it was just the two of us, and it was his birthday, so I was going to pay all of it, and it hadn't been brilliant. <laughs> and we had escaped, so... <laughs> But we did the right thing, of course we did. We went back, well, we, we put the money in a safe and then tipped it in the canal. See how they like it. <laughs> so that's by way of a little introductory anecdote about how sometimes it can be quite fun to deliberately trap yourself in a particular situation. The rest of the show is about my excellent new wife and baby. <laughs> Since I last saw you, people of Bristol, I am married, I'm a married man. And I've really, thank you, thank you very much. I've realised I've got to stop showing that to people as if it proves anything. You can just buy these. Um, <laughs> save an awful lot of fuss. But, uh, so we got married last year. I'm sure some of you are married, and like us, you probably spent an entire year getting ready for it. You, so much planning goes into it. Uh, even the guest list. You want to invite everybody. You can't invite everyone you love. Resources are limited. At one point, we found ourselves looking down the guest list, trying to thin it out based on how we reckon people voted on Europe. <laughs> which is... Not even on how they voted, on how we reckon they did. That's, that's worse, isn't it? I'm not going to make things awkward here, obviously, uh, you or anyone watching at home. Uh, I, I don't care which way you voted. I'm sure you don't care which way I voted. Everyone at every show I do is welcome, which is obviously how our lot like to treat people. So... Oh, sure. Sure, yeah, that's some smug middle-class people uh, <laughs> clapping for a smug middle-class guy for suggesting anyone that thinks differently to us is racist. You're welcome. 
But it was tricky. After the referendum, everyone was in the same position. No matter which side you voted, or even if you didn't, everyone had the same reaction the next morning. Every single person opened their front door and went, oh, there are werewolves now. <laughs> there are werewolves out there, and they look like us and smell like us, but they are not us. And all of us looked at our neighbour and went, I'm a villager, what are you? <laughs> oh, you're a villager too? Fantastic, what a relief. Which, which way did you vote, out of interest? For the good of the village. Sounds like werewolf chat. Goodbye. We head away. <laughs> Never been more divided as a nation, have we? Not since cavaliers and roundheads. Not since that whole thing about whether the death of Princess Diana was meaningless or irrelevant. We haven't been... Oh, even here. Even here. She was the princess of our hearts. Neither of those things is a thing. So... <laughs> We got all lovely and married, and uh, it's very exciting. I nearly blew it. Uh, two weeks before the big day, I accidentally used the word bridezilla. Now, before you judge... <laughs> oh, sorry, while you judge me. <laughs> the context is very important. I said to her, look, I'm not saying you're some sort of bridezilla. I'm an idiot. Of course, I should never have said that. She only heard that one word. She stamped her foot. She was furious. She said, no, no, I'm organised zilla. <laughs> it's, that, that's, it's the zilla that's the bad bit, surely. <laughs> Surely that's like, you could be Rainbow Zilla and that would, you could be Fluff Zilla, that would still suggest you were some thousand foot tall fluff monster that was hard to work alongside of. Is it? Organised Zilla is the most formidable opponent, surely. That monster will tear down your skyscraper having first cancelled your building insurance. It doesn't. did it. We, we got away with it and uh, we got lovely and married. And because of the slightly unusual circumstances under which we got together, I won't bore you with the details, but basically a six-year long-distance relationship. I lived in London. She lived in Bristol. Where are we going to live? She got tactically pregnant. Now I live in Bristol. <laughs> and, and I'm sensing I'm not the only person here that was taken out by that particular trip. <laughs> But because of that, what it means is that we are now living together with a baby and married when we haven't really had that much time living together before. Now, I know the married people are thinking, Ooh. <laughs> I am learning some fascinating things about her which are permanent. So, <laughs> one of them, for example, is that she has terrible insomnia. I knew that, but I didn't realise the breadth of her insomnia. She's a really light sleeper. So when I get home after a gig, as I will most nights, maybe midnight, one in the morning, I creep into our house. I have to, I have to almost break into our house like I'm a burglar. I have to slide the key into the lock like I'm burgling it. I push the door open. I've oiled the hinges. Um, uh, olive oil, but if you don't fry with it, it's fine. I have to... <laughs> I have to tiptoe over floorboards one, five, and seven, and then take my trousers off downstairs, because if I take my trousers off in our bedroom, the clink of my belt buckle hitting the floor, that'll wake her up. So I have to carry my clothes as I creep upstairs naked, like a sexy burglar. Um, is that what they're called? Um, and then I get onto the landing, and I have to wee in the dark, because we've got a pull-cord light switch, so no matter how slowly you pull it, like, there's a chance you let go, that'll wake her up. I've said to her, let's get a new light switch. She says, it's not a problem. It is a problem. So then I'm, I'm negotiating my way around the bathroom. I have to wee down the side of the toilet, the, the inside. I'm not a monster. It's not some sort of dirty protest. I'm going to... It's a secret ninja wee of the sort that men think only men can do, but women are like, oh, I've got moves. And then <laughs> creep into the bedroom, peel back the duvet, assume the length of a sort of rhythmic gymnast, and then roll over my axis, peel the duvet back over me, and lie there, prone and unmoving, until I fall asleep. And I have to do that every night for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was completely prepared to compromise, but it's the scope of it I wasn't ready for. She has an apparently real medical condition. She... Not one that was diagnosed by a doctor, but one that she read about on BuzzFeed, but it is real. She suffers. We suffer. She has a condition which some of you might actually suffer from this and not even know it has an official name. It's called misophonia, and that is the technical term for her physical revulsion at the sound of me eating anything at all. <laughs> Just take a pause there while couples look at each other and go, see, I know, 
There's a lot of it about. And, and it's so damaging to our relationship because whatever I'm eating, like an adult, I should point out, with my lips closed, with manners, quietly, whether it's cheese on toast, beans on toast, <laughs> toast, I'm not Jamie Oliver. <laughs> whatever I'm quietly, politely munching on, she will be sat next to me just suffering. She doesn't have a go at me. It would be easier if she had a go at me, but she doesn't. She just visibly suffers. Uh, I go, are you all right? Mm. Uh. So, do you understand what's going on? I, something I need to do in order to live makes her wish I were dead. Have you, have you any idea how that feels? So now, whenever we eat together, we have to play loud jazz in the background. So, uh, so at least we're in the same boat. We both wish we were dead. <laughs> She's got quite a weird attitude towards food generally. She, uh, I know some of you will be vegetarian, some of you will be vegan. My wife is a third thing. She's what's called a flexitarian. Uh, and that means she eats exclusively electrical cables. No. Um, <laughs> what it means is she has flexible ethics towards the food that she eats. So see if you can follow me <laughs> through this. She will have, um, she'll have white meat, like chicken, but not red meat but bacon. <laughs> She'll have pepperoni on a pizza, but not sausage. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> She's an adult. She knows it's from the same animal. Unless she thinks you can somehow shear a pig of its delicious edible fleece. <laughs> Fry that up. I mean, that'd be good if that's how meat worked, isn't it? Give a man a pig, you feed him for a week. Teach a man to sort of plane a pig, you feed him... <laughs> For the lifetime, the agonising lifetime of one perpetually regrowing pig. That'd be good. That'd be better for the environment if each family just farmed one animal. Friends came over. Oh, hi, guys. Wait there. Come here, Brian. You wouldn't name him. You wouldn't name him. Come here, Wolverine. Right there. God, and if you wanted pulled pork, you could just be gently heating him the entire time. Some of you are looking dismayed at that. Others are like, delicious. I know. She won't have uh, fish, and the reasoning apparently is quite common. She won't have fish because, and I quote, it might look at me. Now, <laughs> I do understand that, but I think if an animal's died so that you can eat its body, the absolute least that animal deserves is that you look it in the eye. Otherwise, where does that end? Yeah, I only eat food that's been snuck up on. Yeah. <laughs> that's just my thing. Yeah, I, uh, it has to be organic, free range, and taken by surprise. Yeah. <laughs> I do think it's weird that we, we, we eat some animals but not others. And I wonder if the ones that we don't eat are aware of it. You know, do they know that they've won the, the food lottery, the meat raffle? Have they got any idea? <laughs> Does it, do, look, we don't eat dogs because dogs are loyal. Trout might be loyal. We never bothered finding out. And I just wonder if the species knows. Does, it, does a cat slink past a butcher shop window going, well, you should have been better at purring, wanker. <laughs> And I wonder if the same thing is true in the vegetable kingdom. Would you ever get like a, a little girl sat in a meadow on a picnic cloth eating a, a carrot stick, overlooked by a daisy? And of course the daisy's full of itself thinking, well, carrot, you see, you should have had petals. I've got petals. <laughs> you know, if you make an effort, I've been buffing my stamen for weeks. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, stamen. And then... <laughs> And then the little girl finishes the carrot stick and reaches over and picks the daisy. Suddenly the tables have turned. No, what are you doing, you mental bitch? I thought we had a deal. <laughs> Down my middle with Gavin. No! <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate their reaction because earlier this year I did that bit in Austin, Texas, where they have neither daisies nor daisy chains. <laughs> as I realised whilst on my knees. <laughs> the French are very cruel. <laughs> That's the end of that bit. They, <laughs> they seem satisfied. <laughs> no, they are. I think in terms of when it comes to cuisine, the average French chef would love to... It's almost like the more they torture the animal, the more pain it suffers, the more rich and complex the flavour. Your basic French chef would love to take, like, uh, we'd take a single frog, you know, and then... We break his heart very slowly <laughs> over many months. His wife, she leave him because of evidence that we have planted in his lily pad. 
Oh, his heart did break a very sad time for him, and then he is sent to prison for a crime he cannot possibly have committed. A little froggy hand would not fit in the gloves, the fingers are webbed, but no matter. He is sentenced to a life in prison and forced to watch through the bars as all of his tadpoles but one are smashed in a canvas sack. Then, then he must languish for four years in uh, garlic and a little butter. <laughs> then we stage a breakout. The little frog is free, or so he think. He drive away in a small red car. Alouette, gentil, alouette. <laughs> he starts then to rebuild his life. You know, he meet a beautiful young lady frog. They consummate the relationship. Very passionate, very sexy time. And then our great deception is revealed. The lady frog is his own tadpole from earlier on. No, he say. Why you do this to me? Incest a relationship very much frowned upon, even though la communauté amphibienne. Then... <laughs> His heart did break a second time, consumed with passion and grief and madness. He climbed to the top of Notre Dame Cathedral. He hurled himself from the parapet into a pastry case. It is mwah. <laughs> oh, nice. Now, now, we don't watch much TV, obviously, because uh, now we have a child. But the one show we always make an appointment to view is David Attenborough's Planet Earth. I find that genuinely the most gripping television out there because you've got no idea where it's going to go. It's not a plot, but when they pit these animals... <laughs> they don't pit them against each other at all. It's not like in a car park. God, do him. No, they... <laughs> But whatever happens in, 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 that, in that documentary, you've got no idea who's going to live, who's going to die, and they often trick you. So you'll be watching a little shrew run away from some wanker of a hawk who's got all the status, the whole sky to himself. You're thinking, run, mate, run for your life, because he's small and furry, so he must be a goodie. He's running, and then he does escape, and you're like, you thought he was toast? No way, you did it, yes, in your beak, hawk face. And then the hawk circles sadly away, and that's when Attenborough comes on the voiceover. The hawk knows if she cannot feed her chicks by the end of the week, they will all die. <laughs> immediately you flip. It's only a bloody shrew. Go and get... I, I saw where it went. Suddenly I'm grassing up a field mouse. There it is, get in. And they won't intervene, will they? The camera crews, the BBC camera crews, absolutely will not intervene. Well, obviously, if it's like a, a tiger and a human baby, they'll probably make a call. <laughs> But my, my wife's brother, my new brother-in-law, is a BBC Natural History Department camera assistant, and he was saying there is only one instance, you can check this out online, where they actually intervened. They were in the Antarctic shooting penguins, filming penguins. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very different show. <laughs> it's all on the licence, bro. He was quite high up. Yeah, he was on a ledge. <laughs> Cutting devil. <laughs> But they're, they're in the Antarctic, they're, they're filming penguins, and we know the way penguins work. There's the lovely little fluffy grey penguin chick, the mum and the dad take it in turns to go off and get the fish, and then bring the fish back to give to the penguin. And, uh, and the mum had died, and the dad had gone off, and he got the fish, he'd come back with it, but he couldn't find the little penguin chick. He was right there in a little, whatever a uh, big crevice is called, a crevasse. It can't be that easy. <laughs> whatever it is, just in a dip. And he's, he's kind of, like, you know, freaking out. But he's right there, the little chick's right there, and all of the camera operators are stood there going... He's there, he's right there. And they and they they pointed him out and they moved the chick. That's the one time. And he fed the little penguin chick and it grew up, it lived, and that little penguin chick grew up to be Donald Trump. <laughs> Oh, it makes you think. <laughs> Speaking, of course, of uh, uh, petty, uh, charismatic, but possibly insane authority figures, you'd love my baby. Now, he is... <laughs> he's such a... I love him so much. He's, I love it. I've never yearned for anyone before. I yearn for him. I love his mum. She's absolutely fine. But this guy... <laughs> oh, God, I love... I want to... Oh. I, I happily drift off to sleep at night just imagining his little chubby thigh and just going... <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I'm not weird, you're weird. <laughs> just gently, gently with the lips over the teeth. <laughs> Until he relaxes. And then... <laughs> and of course a tiny part of you in the back of your mind is thinking... <clears throat> but you must never... <laughs> That's, that's a don't do. I've been briefed. 
I don't know why I don't know why it behooves me to wish to devour my offspring. I don't know why that's <laughs> useful to us in evolutionary terms. His, I just feel like he'd be he'd be safe in my tummy. <laughs> I don't know what his mum would come home. Where's the baby? The child is secure. <laughs> Where is the child? Ch -ch 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 -ch. You had your turn. And I miss him. I miss him like crazy. I'm away touring four or five nights away on the road, and then I finally get to see him, and I play with him, and I'm fucking bored in two minutes. <laughs> I love him. I love him. But you can't play with a baby. There's, he can barely sit up. He can, he can sit up, but if you tip him over, he can't get back up. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> The mornings I find the hardest bits. Now, in, in a room with this many people in it, maybe 10 or 15 of you will be morning people. You'll be the sort of people that bounce out of bed in the morning like a businessman with a rucksack. I, mean, I love seeing that. A bloke in a suit with trainers and a rucksack. Yeah, I'm going to work, but I've got options. I love it. <laughs> What's in the rucksack? Soil. Oh. <laughs> Some of you will be like that because you love your life, you love your job. Most of us, I would suggest, don't love our jobs. Most of us are just like, oh, I'm just trying to get enough money to stop. <laughs> I'm just trying to get enough cash together to get a box, and then I'm going to get in the box and then die. <laughs> I win. There better not be a heaven. <laughs> yeah. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't leap out of bed. Most of us sort of wake up like, uh, uh, oh, oh, what? Oh, God, not again. Oh, no, not only have I got to do this again, but the person I have to do it as is this. <laughs> and that's hard enough when you, when you don't have a child, but when there's this little kid looking up at you with these big eyes like saucers, going, love me, look after me, feed me, nourish me, uh, uh, nurture me, entertain me, improvise some sort of space opera using all my toys. That's what all the other dads are doing, I imagine. <laughs> So I take him for a walk. You've got to do something with him. And in doing this, I'm breaking a, a promise I made as a younger man. I, I promised myself I'm never taking my family for walks. Because I remember, as I'm sure you do, on a Sunday afternoon, sat reading comics or something, age 11 or 12, and your dad would come in and go, all right, get your shoes on, we're going for a walk. <laughs> what? Come on, you heard we're going for a nice family walk. Where? Back here. <laughs> Why? And he'd never tell you the truth, would he? He'd never say, I'll tell you why, you. You're why. I don't want to go for a walk. You think your mum wants to go for a walk? We can't all just sit here staring at each other. Come on, shoes on, we're going for a walk. And then you go round the block, or a bridal path, if you're lucky, and then you get back home and he'd go, there, a nice family walk. Parenting, tick. <laughs> so I take him for a walk. At 6, 6.30 in the morning, I've got to take him for a walk. I put him in the papoose, and I go for a pointless walk to nowhere around the neighbourhood. I put him in that, you know, the forward facing, like the baby Bjorn thing. The one where it looks like the adult is a robot slave that the child is controlling. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. And, uh, and I walk around the neighbourhood, and what I'm really doing is sort of jealously looking in other people's recycling boxes at the front of their houses. Uh, oh yeah, they've had a party. Mm. <laughs> Student house or lone alcoholic, hard to tell. <laughs> Apple lager, the world's gone mad. <laughs> Staggering around, and every so often you'll see another dad, you'll encounter another dad going the other way, doing exactly the same thing. You'll have the briefest moment of connection, just a little... <laughs> 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 if we were mums, we'd communicate, we might support each other, we might make a friend. But we're dads, we have to have an emotional Mexican standoff. <laughs> 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 All it would take is one of us, once, to go... Are you all right? And we dissolve into each other's arms <laughs> and hold each other as men must. <laughs> but you can't take the risk when you're a dad. You've got to decide how much of the vortex to share. You can't open with, we fucked our lives! <laughs> in, in case he goes, no, everything's fine. <laughs> That's what I meant, yeah. <laughs> So I, I take him home and I've got to read to him. Obviously, I love reading. I love narrative. I love stories. I love the idea of helping a person grow their personality and become themselves. I just don't want to read him this book again now. <laughs> and the thing about children's books, if you, I don't know if you know this, but basically 
every kid's book, all the good ones, whatever it's about on the surface, it's secretly about something else. So it'll be like a banana in a cowboy hat. And then halfway through, you'll go, oh, oh, that's clever. It's a, actually an analogy. It's actually about friendship or memory or Bitcoin. <laughs> There's some... <laughs> It's teaching my kid. And the moment you work that out is often a very sort of emotional moment. You're very vulnerable, seven maybe in the morning. Oh, God. His favourite book is a story called Grandad's Island. Perhaps you know it. It's a brilliant book. I highly recommend it. A little boy called Sid goes to visit his granddad. He can't find him in the house. And so he goes upstairs and he finds a magic door, walks through it, and then he stood with his granddad on the deck of a boat, sailing off to a beautiful island. Shout out when you can see where this is going. <laughs> they arrive. They land, they arrive on the island, and there are incredible rainforests and lush tropical plants and, and uh, parrots, tigers, and an orangutan. It's a lot like paradise. <laughs> He's not coming back from this island, is he? Oh, God, sure enough, it's a metaphor for grief and death. Sid goes back on the boat and travels home alone because his granddad decides to stay on Granddad's island forever. And I'm looking at the kid thinking, this should come with a warning. <laughs> <laughs> Contains metaphor, do not read before noon. <laughs> Just looking at this baby and all I'm, all I'm thinking is, well, I mean... None of us are coming back from the island, are we? <laughs> Everyone ends up on the island. He's gone, but he's not gone. He's, he's sort of in the space library. Have you seen Interstellar? Never mind. <laughs> but it, it could be worse, couldn't it? His favourite story could be a book called The Comedian, in which a little baby learns that there are certain nice things he can't have because Daddy's following his dream. <laughs> Can you not clap that? <laughs> but it was a weird year to have a baby. When our child was first conceived, the world was a very different place. He was going to grow up to be European, and Obama was in the White House. And yeah, he was drone-striking people, but he could dance. <laughs> and I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm not a fan of drones. You probably like them. You know those drones? <laughs> those ones? I don't like them. I think they're dicks. <laughs> No, they are. They're my least favourite robot. <laughs> because they're smug. I like a humble robot. I like the bomb disposal guy. You know that little robot? The guy, the guy that goes around pulling the wires out of stuff and getting blown up. I love him. He's such a selfless little guy, isn't he? He's just like tank tracks, a little boxy body, and an arm with two claws on it for pulling wires out, and then a head that's basically a pair of binoculars on a stick with eyebrows. <laughs> you know the guy. Basi basically Wall E, or if you're old, Johnny Five. <laughs> You're old. <laughs> He's so humble, isn't he? Am I going to get blown up again? Almost certainly. Uh, I know my place. <laughs> and in the robot bar after work, you'd want to hang out with him, wouldn't you? He'd be sat there with a pint of real ale and a mountain goat's T-shirt. Uh, another tough day on the job. <laughs> and next to him in the booth would be all the drones sat there like city boy wankers. <laughs> Yeah, seen that Nespresso? I fucked her. <laughs> All my friends are dead. <laughs> the only robot more humble than him is the Mars rover. You know the one they send up to Mars? It's probably the same guy. <laughs> you survive 25 bombing missions, they're like, congratulations, you're going to Mars. How am I getting back from Mars? Have you ever read Grandad's Island? <laughs> and I want to be like him. I, I want to be selfless. I want to be humble. I want to put other people, put my family first. But as soon as you have a baby, it x-rays your life and it shows up in stark relief all of the bits you were trying to get away with and gloss over. Like, I can't cook. Right? I can't cook, my wife can't cook, I'm a good feminist, I didn't expect her to do all the cooking, nor did I think it through and realise that would mean I had to do all the cooking and I, I can't cook. <laughs> and I know a few of you can cook and the rest of us hate you because you're smug. <laughs> because you swan around going, well, just wang it in the oven, just chuck it in, just chuck it, yeah, just fuck it in the oven, fuck it. <laughs> that just, bang, just bang it in the oven, all right. 
just whamming it in the oven, mate. Just stick it in there. For how long? Oh, you know, the correct amount of time. <laughs> right. <laughs> at, what, at what temperature? The right one, you know. <laughs> And they buy me, my friend buys me a recipe book. Every year on my birthday, he buys me a recipe book. There's no point buying me a recipe book. That's like buying a lonely man the phone book. It's all in there. <laughs> so at five o'clock every evening in our household, the same thing always happens. It all gets a bit train spotting. Where's it coming from? <laughs> How are we going to get nutrients? <laughs> I don't know. Did you buy any ingredients? I don't know what they are. Me neither. <laughs> So we've got two solutions. Mine is takeaway, unsustainable. My wife's solution, let's go to bed. Bed! <laughs> At five! She said that once. How Dickensian is that? We shall retire to our chambers. In the morning, we shall send the boy to the workhouse. Her other, her other solution is uh, soup. Let's deal with this. Soup is not a meal. Soup isn't a meal in the same way that water isn't a drink. I only know three things about cooking. Soup isn't a meal. Only idiots buy pasta in restaurants. It's pasta. <laughs> and if you ever see a crepe van, buy a crepe. <laughs> Just rules to live by. You ever see a crepe van? Probably one out there tonight. Whenever you see a crepe van, do yourself a favour. Do the world a favour. Do the crepe community a favour. <laughs> and could be sweet, could be savoury. You don't have to eat it. Just get over yourself and buy a crap, all right? <laughs> There'll be one out there tonight, some legend, some absolute champion in the back of a van selling a thimble full of batter for as little as four or five pounds. <laughs> buy a crap and support our lads. <laughs> but fortunately, we are able to keep the child alive thanks to the introduction of pouch technology. Now, I know some of you will have grown-up children. Anyone have grown-up children along here? How old is your eldest, madam? 28. 28. When that child was a baby, you didn't have access to a little foil pouch full of fruit and veg with a plastic nozzle on it. No, you had to go out into the fields and harvest. <laughs> you had to, I, I don't know about your life. You had to drag a load of swede back and put it in a barrel and then stamp on it while a bloke played the accordion. But now, now we have pouch technology. We have, we have access to these little fruity pouches made by a company called Daisy's Larder. <laughs> and, you know, there are any combination of that, you know, Tarquin's Pantry, <laughs> Kevin's Box. <laughs> <laughs> What's in the box, Kevin? <laughs> Soil. <laughs> But they're all called, whatever they're from, they're all called this, th like, on the, on the cover, it'll be something like a avocado, apple, pea, and asparagus. And you'll go, well, that very much sums up the kind of parent that I consider myself to be. <laughs> and then you look on the back, 99.9% .9 apple. Screw you, Daisy! <laughs> there is one honest one. It's called pears, pears, pears. <laughs> And it is 100% pear, but it weighs less than a pear. So really, it should be called nearly a pear. <laughs> and what you're supposed to do is squirt it onto a spoon and feed it to the baby. And sometimes he's like, mm, like this. So, you know, you get, it's got a nozzle, right? You just, <laughs> like that. Just, <laughs> and then drop it sideways like a hitman. It's in. The nutrients are in the kid. Sometimes he won't even have that. I can't be the first parent who's ever thought, mate, there's a nozzle on this. I could turn you over, pull them down. <laughs> if it weren't for ecstasy in the 90s, it would work for fruit puree in 2018. I'm not... I'm not a bad person. But she buys him blueberries. Right? Not little blueberries for £1.89. M&S Food Hall, <laughs> four pounds a punnet, blueberries. Blueberries are a luxury item that he cannot appreciate and I can ill afford. <laughs> and I should say, I've not had this conversation with my wife, I'm just hoping the material gets back to her. <laughs> I don't know why, why they're so expensive. We're, he doesn't, he won't even appreciate them now. He's too young to appreciate treats. Why don't we get the money we would have spent on blueberries every month, put it in a jar, and then on his 18th birthday, I can have a new car. What's wrong with that? <laughs> he doesn't even eat them. I'll tell you what he does, he alternates. He gets one, and he looks at me and goes... 
Like Nero played by Rick Mail. <laughs> and then he'll get the next one, roll it into his mouth with his fist, like, mm, give it one squish and then spit it in his bib. <laughs> I can't eat that now. That's the wrong way around, isn't it? I'm supposed to be the alpha in our household, at least out of me and him. <laughs> I should be getting first squish and spitting it into his open mouth like a penguin. <laughs> or, or like your dog, who you think loves you. You know, <laughs> dog owners are like, no, he's kissing me. He's not kissing you. The reason your dog licks your face is he wants you to spit chewed food into his mouth like his mum did when he was a puppy. <laughs> he may also love you. I don't know about your relationship. <laughs> he's kissing me. He's not kissing you. Same with Italians. <laughs> Genuinely. If you ever go to Rome, keep an olive in your mouth, and then if anyone like, mwah, mwah, mm, grazie tanto. <laughs> I'm just saying there's cheaper fruit available, as the pouch companies well know. <laughs> and I, I'm looking at this packaging. We got used to wacky packaging, didn't we? A few years ago, if you wanted to buy a cup of coffee on the high street, you'd look for a shop with a picture of a cup of coffee or the word coffee. Now, if you want to buy a coffee, you've got to look for a glass-fronted building just covered in random verbs. Breathe, inspire, create. Yeah. <laughs> just any words. Inflate, cringe, betray. <laughs> we got used to it. We got used to it. But the one on this packet is the worst. It's a speech bubble written from the point of view of a presumably fictional four-year-old girl. At least I hope she's fictional. <laughs> it sounds worse than it is. If she's... If she's real, I hope she's absolutely fine. I wish her well. But I hope she's fictional. <laughs> and if she is fictional, I hope she dies. <laughs> I hope she gets mauled to death by a mythical beast. That would be appropriate. Specifically, a manticore. <laughs> a manticore is my favourite mythical creature when I was a kid. It's a Persian mythical beast. It's the head of a lion, body of a lion. <laughs> That's a lion. No. Uh, <laughs> Head, head, head of a lion, body of a lion, wings of an eagle, tail of an entire snake, but with the head at the other end of the snake, right? So I used to love it. I used to find that hilarious as a kid. I see that in a book. I think that's great, because from the point of view of other lions, they're like, whoa, mega lion. From the point of view of the snake community, they're like, Jesus Christ, have you seen what Quentin's got on his ass? <laughs> Now, I have to say, that is my, one of the funniest thoughts I've ever had, but no one ever knows what a manticore is, so it needs just way too much groundwork. Um, Medusa. Medusa? Yeah. yeah. From the point of view of the snake community, Medusa is just a tangle of Siamese snakes all sharing one massive club foot with a face on it. <laughs> Katie Hopkins? Katie Hopkins. Okay, so from the point of view of the snake community, <laughs> Katie Hopkins is a bit... Much. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thing in the morning, this packaging thing with its speech bubble. I'm very psychically weak at that time. My defences, I'm very vulnerable. My defences are down. And I'm looking at this, this thing with its, its a speech bubble with its font and the R's and the S's are the wrong way round. It's all cutesy and crayony. Our daddy said that he would make lovely healthy food for all the little children. And we made him promise it would always be fair trade. And he agreed. And you're thinking, is this it? Is this the morning I end up on the cover of Take a Break? <laughs> There's only one good thing comes of this. It raises the spectre that somewhere out there in the world is a demented, screaming, four-year-old CEO of a food conglomerate <laughs> wailing at her beleaguered, weeping father going, No, Daddy, of course we can't make the bananas fair trade. Think of the fucking margins, you muppet. <laughs> I'm not an angry person. <laughs> Genuinely not. I've had, in my life, I've had no relationship with anger really at all. It's never been a problem for me. But you know what it's like when you finally get a thing that you've wanted for so long. Like, okay, last year, I had a, a big birthday, right? One of, the, one of the two main big... Of the two you're thinking, the higher one. <laughs> A birthday so big that my manager doesn't want me to say the number out loud on stage because she feels it will harm my television prospect. <laughs> As the granite temple door of that age came slamming down forever, at the last second, I managed to roll underneath it. Wife, baby, leather hat, yes! <laughs> but you know what it's like when you suddenly get a thing or things that you wanted so badly, and then you find yourself sitting alone in your car, howling with impotent fury at no one. 
Don't go quiet on me now. <laughs> Everyone does this and no one ever talks about it. As a comedian, it's my job to normalise it. I should be making sure that everyone knows that everyone does it and you're not weird. I should be starting my show every night by going, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Where do you do your howling? It's important. <laughs> the first time I ever mentioned it, I was at a gig in Soho in central London and I was out on stage and I, I did a few minutes and I just stopped and I went, look, I'm just going to be honest with you. You know what it's like when you're sat alone in your car howling with rage? And they just looked at me. It was the loneliest I've ever felt on stage. It cast a shadow of doubt across my entire emotional landscape. Anyway, they don't have cars. So that's the... <laughs> but everyone does it, and there's no role models, no one to reassure us that we all do it. You never get Tom Cruise, right? I love Tom Cruise. I know. I love... <laughs> I love his film work specifically. And you never get Tom Cruise mid-action movie go, right, okay, you bring the truck around the front, you get the guns and the missile launcher in the back of the trunk. Brilliant. You put the money in the bag in case we need it later on. You get the helicopter and you grab the rubber head and brick. what do you mean which one? There's only two and the, the one the entire mission is, no, I realise, no, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I know. I'm just saying that I assumed, I made an assumption, that's my fault, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I know you're tired as well. That doesn't mean I'm not also tired. Just, just wait there, wait there. Absolutely fine. No, the, uh, the mission was just looking a bit possible. Let's go. <laughs> And I should stress, this isn't a cry for help. I'm very happy. <laughs> I'm very happy. I've never been so happy. I completed therapy. <laughs> I did. I got an email. <laughs> Glad that didn't go to spam. I'd been, I'd been seeing a therapist for about four years, and I got an email from him one day last year saying, Dear Stu, I notice we've not spoken to each other for six months. Does this mean our journey together is concluded? I was like, wow. Yeah. I suppose it does. I hadn't realised there was an end point. I didn't realise it was like, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, and happy. <laughs> you know, the first time you have your heart broken, you wake up every morning thinking about that person, and then maybe months later, there's one morning when you get to lunchtime, and you go, oh, I wasn't thinking about them. And you suddenly realise that's you starting to get over them. I didn't realise the same thing could happen with happiness. My second thought, of course, was that his business model is dog shit, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> What's he thinking? If that was me, I would have an auto-triggered email that's sent every six months going, Dear you, I notice we've not spoken for six months. A lot of my clients think they're happy around about now, <laughs> but it's really during the seventh month when we get what we in the industry call Suicide Wednesday. So <laughs> if you find yourself staring at a wall, weeping, reflecting on what your former school friends now earn, just give us a call. We'll get something in the diary. Blah, 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 blah. He's not so much killed the golden goose as cured it of its ability to ovulate precious metals. <laughs> That sentence, too dense. <laughs> and then I realised what it was. It's not anger, it's grief. I've been grieving the death of my younger self. I'm grieving because he's dead, and I'm grieving because I killed him. <laughs> I had to. I had to, to get what I wanted. I had to, to move on with my life. I had to knit a pillow out of responsibility and duty and love, and I had to sneak up behind him <laughs> as he was lying in bed watching a box set I no longer have time for. <laughs> I had to hold it down over his head as he kicked and struggled and dropped his comic books and his condoms and his Wagamama loyalty card. <laughs> and all of his money, I had to hold it down. It was the right thing to do. I'd do it again, but it's, it's been a while now, and I should probably bury him. <laughs> I used to have surface happiness, you know? I used to have that kind of, yeah, let's go out, let's get hammered, way. But it took me years to learn there was a gap underneath, there was a gap in the middle, and once I'd learnt it was there, it took me ages to fill it. Now I am driven by a molten core of joy, and on the surface, just oceans of resentment. <laughs> but at least, at least I have increased the possibility now that at the end of my life, 
there will be someone there with me to do the thing. I think that's why people have families, really, isn't it? Just to make sure that when you go, there's someone there who can just... <laughs> just do the thing properly, yeah. The eyes, the eye thing. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not beat me over a barcode, the eyes. <laughs> it's just, just that, isn't it? Respectful, just that. Or if you're sitting up, that. <laughs> or if it was an explosion, I always wondered when I was a kid, is that a thing you get taught when you're a grown-up? When you see someone do that in a movie, and you think, oh my God, imagine, that's a lot of pressure to be under, isn't it? If you've never done it before, and there's other people there, and someone goes in front of you, and you're like, I'll take care of it. It's weird, isn't it? Every time I see someone do it, I always think, it looks like they've got the ability to go, dead, alive, dead, <laughs> alive again, and dead. See you later. Oh, no, no. You don't do it to yourself, obviously. That's <laughs> that would be a baller move. <laughs> if at the end of your life, you did the eyes thing to yourself. <laughs> Especially if your last words had been, I've got this. Ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, one last story to tell you. I'm going to tell you about how I dropped him. Now... <laughs> when you hear people say, holding the baby, like, oh, Muggins here was left holding the baby, that sounds like a negative thing, doesn't it? But it turns out it's preferable... <laughs> ..to dropping the baby. <laughs> we, take him, we take him swimming. And uh, I resent that because, as far as I'm concerned, the defining characteristic of becoming an adult is that no one can make you go swimming anymore, right? <laughs> you're a kid, you're like, come on, we're going swimming. I don't want to. No one cares. You get dragged along, you've got to get all changed and it's all awkward and, and cold and there's all pubes on the floor <laughs> and none on you and you're like, oh, God, I don't know. And then you go for a swim, which is basically a walk, except you can immediately die. <laughs> And then you get back from your swim and you've got to do the same thing again in reverse and it's all cold and chafing and wet and awful and towels. And, uh, <laughs> and you think that's it, you become a grown-up, you think, that's it. No one can make me go swimming anymore. I'm an adult. And then you have a child and your partner goes, well, you're taking him swimming. And you go, no, there was a line in the sand. <laughs> there was a principle. So anyway, I take him swimming and we go... <laughs> we go to our local fantastic baby swimming club. Now, there's a lot of things you can do with your baby during the day. A lot of them are just basically parent suicide prevention. They just get them out of the house, get them back in the world, get them doing stuff. They're not all good. Baby yoga, I've got some questions about. I think I've never been, but I assume it's just a hippie with six babies on a foam mat going, just breathe, babies, just breathe. <laughs> You're probably a bit tired out, a bit wound up after your fifth nap. Just breathe while I count the money. Um, <laughs> But I tell you, a really good one is baby sign language. I cannot stress how good this is. If you're having a kid, when they're a baby, take them to baby sign language. They can communicate before they can talk. You can learn some basic signs and actually have a chat with them. You can learn, like, milk, biscuit, breach, breach, snipers, three, on the roof, go, go, stack up, A squad. But I do approve of baby swimming. So we go along to rubber ducks and we all get in the swimming pool together and we swish the babies from side to side. I don't know why we take them swimming. Everyone knows babies can basically swim anyway. We've all seen the Nirvana album cover. You, you wave 10 bucks at them and they just like, I think, it's, I think it's because he used to be sperm quite recently. So he sort of remembers. <laughs> So we get them there and, and, we, and we swish them around as we all sing the school song. Often, I'm the only dad there, and as a result, I've got a deeper register in my voice, which means that everyone can hear that I don't know the words or the tune, and I've got no concept of what key is. <laughs> and it's just me and nine mums in bikinis, and you can't make friends with them because it's hard. <laughs> I don't respect you at all. 
swish them from side to side. Welcome everyone to Rubber Ducks. We'll have lots of fun at Rubber Ducks. I wish I were dead at Rubber Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I used to resent it. I don't mind it now. He quite enjoys it. So we finish up. And then after the session, we go into the changing rooms. 99% of the mums are in the female... Sorry, 100% of the mums <laughs> are in the... There's not one who snuck in. <laughs> Just hiding in a locker. It's been ages. Give us a look. <laughs> I mean, 99% I mean of the time, I'm the only dad in the gents' changing rooms. In the mums one, they've got chat and bonding and mutual support and our trust games, I don't know, uh, knitting... <laughs> And, uh, and crucially, they have a travel cot which you can put your baby in while you do the chafee getting changed awkward bit. There's no travel cot in the gents' changing rooms. There is now. <laughs> since the incident. So, <laughs> so there's nowhere to put him but a bench. So there's a bench there, a bit lower, lower, not, not a lot lower. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't drop him, I put him. I put him on the bench and I told him don't fall off, you fall off, no, right? And I, so I held him with one foot <laughs> as I turned naked to wring my shorts out in the little grill thing there, but I couldn't quite reach, so I chanced it and I, would just, I just hopped. He seized the moment, he spooned himself off the bench, I teleported back across the room and I caught him, but I caught him too late. I, <laughs> I caught him like this, like that, like I protected the floor is what I did. <laughs> I got probably the replay would show that I got him on the bounce. It was probably like, whoa. <laughs> and he didn't cry, which is worse than if he'd cry. <laughs> and I'm gathering him up and, and drying him and drying myself and freak him out. And of course, the big question, do I tell his mum? <laughs> no. <laughs> But then what if he's got concussion and they're together, I've gone off somewhere else in a few hours, he starts, you know, and she doesn't know why. Still no, she's got enough on her plate, it's fine. So I finished getting him dry and uh, I went out just as I was leaving. There was another dad in the room on, on that occasion, he was getting his little girl ready for the next session and he dealt with it brilliantly. He didn't look at me or make eye contact at all. <laughs> And until just as I was leaving, I pushed the door open and I shot him a glance that I intended to mean, we shall say nothing of this. <laughs> and he looked back at me with a look that I interpreted as fathers for justice. <laughs> so went outside to the car park, got the kid in his car seat, put him in, strapped him in his little baby car seat in the back of the car. I got in the back of the car next to him, shaking, closed the car door. He started howling. And I joined in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.